Now I want to introduce the book of Job. Now Job is a job if you don't if you don't have somebody to help you through it because it's 42 chapters of mostly poetry and the arguments get a little heavy and weighty but we trust through our study of the nature of the book and some of its most important teachings that you'll come to a better understanding of it. I'm going to begin with an outline of the book. It'll be rather brief, but it's almost necessary for your reading of it. We won't get into the reading of any of it tonight, so that'll give you a week to read 42 chapters. Now here's a brief outline, but it will really help you. First of all is the prologue. I've divided it into three parts. The prologue. Chapters 1 and 2. Then the second division, the poetic discourses. The poetic discourses. Chapters 3 through 42, verse 6. Chapter 3 through chapter 42 and verse 6. Now, I have that divided. I want to give you that. In chapter 3, we have Job's lament. And next, the first cycle of speeches, chapters 4 to 14. The first cycle of speeches, 4 through 14. And then the second cycle of speeches, chapters 15 to 21. Third cycle of speeches, 22 through chapter 31. 22 to 31. The speech of Elihu, E-L-I-H-U, the speech of Elihu is 32 to 37. The addresses of God, he doesn't make a speech, he addresses Job. The addresses of God, 38 through 41. The repentance of Job, 42, 1 to 6. The repentance of Job, 42, verses 1 to 6. And then the epilogue is the third division. The epilogue, E-P-I, that means the end. Epilogue, 42, verses 7 to 17. Prologue, Poetic Discourses, the Epilogue. But as you read the book and you follow that simple outline, it'll break it up so you can understand it better. Job is not an easy book just by sitting down reading. I've translated a lot of it in the Hebrew, which was helpful. Now let's look at some introductory matters because they're very important to understanding God's Word something about background and the man Job, nature of the book, and so on. So we look first of all at an analysis of the book to help our understanding. We find, first of all, we've got a poem belonging to the wisdom literature class. And that, of course, is what we're studying. A poem belonging to the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. The basic problem of the book, why do the righteous suffer? Which we'll eventually get to, to answer that. The basic problem of the book, why do the righteous suffer? Now, the Hebrew conception, in fact, the scriptural principle is that The wicked suffer and the righteous are blessed. Now that's a valid biblical principle, but that didn't happen in Job's case. It's the reverse. So they've got a real problem on their hands. That's why you have these cycle of speeches. Job protests his innocence and his friends all try to accuse him of being guilty of sin. So the problem of why the righteous suffer 
we can ask another question. Is the Hebrew conception that righteousness brings divine blessing and wickedness brings misfortune, is that conception always true? The Hebrew conception that righteousness brings divine blessing and health and prosperity while wickedness results in punishment and judgment is that principle always valid? You see, even Job thought it was until he started suffering all of these terrible adversities and no answers. You see, chapters 1 and 2 were not written until after he went through all of those 40 some odd chapters by faith. Now, what's the theme of the book? The theme of the book is the universal question of whether or not, the universal question of whether or not suffering is a sign of divine displeasure and thus presupposes sin on the part of the sufferer. The theme of the book is the universal problem of whether or not suffering is a sign of divine displeasure and presupposes sin on the part of the person suffering. Just by understanding that much, then as you read the book, you see what they're wrestling with. There are a lot of theories about the book and this and that and the other, but the, I think most would agree on what we've just said, that regardless of conclusions or anything else, that the problem of the book is, why do the righteous suffer? And she read their discourses and their speeches, and Job's replies and his speeches, you come to that conclusion. You would come to that conclusion if you had to pick out the problem of the book or what they're wrestling with. And it's amazing that, as we'll see, we always speak of Job's three friends, but there were four. And God rebukes the first three, but not the fourth one, Elihu. God himself, before Job gets to Revelation of chapters 1 and 2, or whoever wrote the book, we'll come to that later, whether Job or Moses or somebody else, God doesn't give him the answer. He just says, I'm God. That's why I said he wasn't making a speech. He's just addressing himself to Job's complaints. Why do I suffer? I'm righteous. Even you said I was righteous, Lord. God says, I don't have to answer your questions. I'm God. He said, answer me one or two, and then if you can even answer one. Simple question about this universe, then I might be prone to answer your question. Job had to admit he couldn't answer one question. God said, where were you when the foundation of the earth were formed? And how did I put it together? And how did I cause the clouds to float around? So on and so forth. Or he says, if you can't answer the question, then explain to me how nature and life, the deer, the roe, the crocodile and all, how that they're taken care of and fed and multiply and reproduce. And if you're so high and mighty, then tame just one of my creations. I'll give you two choices, either hippopotamus or the crocodile. <laughs> After it's all over, Job admits he's pretty weak, pretty ignorant, and that God is God. And he can do or allow what he pleases, and he's still going to be God. Now, people can complain and protest and blaspheme and reject even if they want to. Job never did that. He complained, but he never did what Satan said he would do, renounce his faith. But after it's all over, no one's going to touch God with their complaints. See, if he just wiped us all out while we're talking, he could do it. He's God. And he could find sufficient basis for justifying it. Maybe even some of your deeds or thoughts today. Hello. First Corinthians 10. God destroyed Israel simply because they raised the question, Is God able to supply bread in the wilderness? 
He rejected them. I hear people calling themselves Christians saying more than that all the time. Well, there's one thing about the book of Job. You'll come out of it with a conception, a greater conception of the things we've taught you for three years in theology and that God is God. He is sovereign. He doesn't have to explain himself. He doesn't explain himself to Job. He says, gird up your loins like a man and answer me. Who is this that replies against God? Tell me. And then he starts naming them for about three or four chapters. This or that. Job couldn't tell him anything. Job says, I repent in dust and in ashes. See, Job had a healthy conception of God. Now, you have to keep in mind, he suffered terrible adversity. Not just the loss of all of his wealth. And he was a wealthy man. In position, he was a prince or maybe a king. At least a prince. And even speaks of himself as a king. Lost his family, his loved ones, and then his health. You know, you can lose almost anything, but when you're in misery and the worms, he says, are crawling all over my flesh, they're eating my flesh, literally eating it. Yes. He didn't have Romans ten seventeen. faith comes from hearing the word, Mark eleven twenty four. Matthew twenty one twenty two. This is doubtless the oldest book in the Bible. He didn't even have the Pentateuch, the first five books. All he had was a passed down revelation from Noah and so forth, you know. And so before you say, oh, Job did a lot of complaining, remember what he was going through without very much revelation. And you'll get quite a conviction about the time, you know, it was air conditioner went out at home or wherever. Oh, the Lord knows I can't prepare a sermon this heat. I didn't say that particular thing. I'm just giving examples. I can assure you that we've all said things after you read the book of Job that you're sorry you've said. Or if somebody didn't like your views or opinion at work or doesn't respect your counsel or advice or has mistreated you, ran out of peanut butter and didn't buy any more. That's just when you wanted it? Well, you say that's trivial. Well, you ought to hear some of the things that we complain about, past tense, have complained about. Some of us, some of you, of course, wouldn't be guilty of complaining about the burned toast or the peanut butter. or You'd never get upset because you were fired because you got the baptism of the Holy Spirit or people threw rocks at your car because you go to the glory barn. That wouldn't upset you, but it does some people. And you have to remind them that that's really kind of Mickey Mouse to what's coming. That that's nothing to get upset about because you've been fired or your wife left or your husband or your children think you've lost your mind or your colleagues tell you you've gone off the deep end or you do get abused and mistreated and property damaged or whatever. Praise God. Because if you think you've had it rough this week, go back and read Job. Read chapters 1 and 2. Oh, he had a terrible, terrible experience. So that will help you appreciate what he was going through. So when you read of the patience of Job, he wasn't always patient. And the Bible didn't say that. It said he endured. James 5 says he endured. Now, the structure of the book, we're looking at the analysis of the book, the structure of the book, the book divides itself into three sections. You can see that from your outline. But I wanted to say something about those three sections. First is the historical prologue. It's a prose narrative. It's written in prose. That isn't poetry, like most of the book. But chapters 1 and 2 is a historical prologue, setting the scene for us. Job didn't have that. He didn't know why he was going through this. That's the whole point to the book. Why am I suffering? Why do the righteous suffer? And then chapter 3 is a transition into the rest of the book. Keep that in mind as you read it. Job's Lament is a transitional chapter right into those series of discourses that will follow. And there he will express his deep grief And he raises two questions. Why was I born? 
But since I'm here, why can't I die? He asks those questions. I mean, that's a heart-rending cry out of the deep anguish he feels because he's lost all of his family, lost all of his possessions, and he's sick with a loathsome disease where worms are literally eating up his flesh. And besides that, he's got three friends that don't help at all, as we'll see. They accuse him of the worst sort of sins. So why was I born, chapter 3? Why can't I die? And having opened that discussion with those questions, then his friends gather around, and we have these three cycles of speeches that follow. And there's a certain order in which those speeches will follow as you read the book. Here's the way it'll go, and it'll repeat itself each time. Eliphaz will speak. Eliphaz speaks, and then Job replies. Then Bildad speaks, and Job replies. And then Zophar speaks, and Job replies. Now, there are three cycles in which that happens just that way each time. It's Eliphaz, Job, Bildad, Job, Zophar, Job, in three cycles. With one exception, in the third cycle, Job has put Zophar to silence. (laughs) Zophar has had it by the third cycle. Now, the style of the book, a lot of views, and I won't burden you with them, But we can reduce the views as to the style of it to two. Some say it's a drama. The book is a drama. When I was in college, the drama department actually put this on, and they traveled the country. And I don't know, some of you may have seen it from Georgetown College. Maybe they're still putting it on. But it isn't a drama because Hebrews had no drama. And the Hebrews would never be guilty of what they are guilty of if they're still doing it. Of course, I'm a religious fanatic for saying this, but I'm going to say it. The Jews would never portray God. Not the Hebrews. Never would. In fact, the one who played Job was unregenerate in a Christian college, but he was unregenerate. In fact, you know, I talked to him about the Lord and gave him my testimony. Well, he said, I'm an agnostic. And they had him playing Job. Southern Baptist School. This book isn't a drama to be acted out on a stage because there was no drama at all in Hebrew culture. That's just one thing that was not in the Hebrew culture. You don't find drama coming on the scene until the Greek and Roman period anyway. But there's one thing the Jews would have never done. They couldn't have acted out this book because they would have never had any man portraying God. That would have been blasphemy. You remember when Jesus came along? They wouldn't even let God say it was God. Another view, which I believe is the right one, is this is a historical poem. Historical poem. It's a historical event expressed in poetic dialogue. Now, if you attend the liberal seminaries, they will raise questions like, now... Of course, you wouldn't even have to be a liberal seminary without the Holy Spirit to raise questions, as some do. And that's where they get into various theories of authorship. How could all of this poetry been remembered by Job? Once you get the baptism, it ceases to be a problem. The Holy Spirit could inspire Job to write it all down with his left hand in five minutes, you know, if he wanted to do it that way. It's like people say, how does Moses know about what happened in Genesis 1 and 2? No one was there except Adam and Eve. Ha ha. And the seminaries say, and of course, those are just figures to speak of mankind. There was no literal Adam and an Eve. The evolutionary theory. And of course, without the baptism, they don't see how God, by vision and revelation and by his voice, could reveal to Moses the whole creation account. The first 11 chapters of Genesis is prehistory pre-recorded history. You know, before the flood, there wouldn't be anything recorded. So, that's how. Not that we need those explanations, but 
at seminary I attended, they would kind of laugh and say, can't you just imagine the three friends of Job and Job speaking in poetry, (laughs) going through all of those discourses in poetry? Which misses the point. Job didn't write it in poetry, or they didn't speak in poetry. It's poetic style. And under the inspiration of the Spirit, for example, it becomes quite poetic often. We've been through that in the earlier part of this course, the poetic nature of the wisdom literature. So when we talk about chapters 3 through 42 being poetry and the other being prose narrative, that's kind of an arbitrary designation because they weren't sitting down thinking up rhyming verses. Poetry, to begin with, doesn't have to rhyme, but it's elevated speech. And out of Job's torment, and out of their... And these are men from the East, by the way, and out of their wisdom, and they speak man's wisdom. Some of it's true, but it isn't all true. Job's friends could naturally come out that way, where a person who's gifted, gifted speaker, and an orator, as these men obviously are, well-disciplined speakers, it would come out that way. That's no problem. I'm just saying some of your religious schools raise the problem about, and you may run into that, and then the devil tries to put doubts in your mind, well, how in the world could they have preserved all of that poetry about what took place? You know, every verse just so neatly outlined there. Job certainly wasn't sitting down, I'm going to write a book called Job, and I'm going to record my speeches and all of theirs. And another thing to keep in mind, Job speaks in chapter 7 and verse 3 of being under this torment for months, for a long time, and this could have taken place over a period. It isn't, when we say cycles of speeches, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of this took place in a matter of a few hours. So these discourses could have taken place over a long period of time. But anyway, what we've got is a historical poem. The nature of the book is... The nature of the book, it is a religious, religious poem dealing with the problem of human suffering. And throughout the book, as you read it, you will notice that the friends of Job state their position right away, what they believe, and they never depart from it in all the cycles of speeches. They never go on to any deeper truth or learn anything. They don't alter their basic philosophic and theological presuppositions they start with. But Job, on the other hand, moves forward little by little through his spiritual struggles until he comes into a deeper understanding of the problem of suffering and a greater stability of his faith. Now that's something to keep in mind as you read the book before next week. You notice his friends don't move from their basic position. Job, you're a sinner. Sinners get punished. That's their basic argument. But Job, while he has many questions and doesn't understand a lot of things, yet he keeps moving a little further into a deeper relationship with God. And finally, out of desperation... And no answers from his friends because they're not helping. They're just hurting the situation. He says, there's one thing I know, my Redeemer liveth. In the last day I'll see him in my flesh. After the worms have eaten up my body, I'll still stand on this earth and see him with my eyes, with my flesh. So he speaks of resurrection and that his Redeemer will vindicate him. He says, he'll vindicate me in the last day. He raises the question, if a man die, will he live again? Yes. And so he comes to a greater depth of understanding through his suffering. His three friends don't move from their basic position. That's why God condemns them in the final analysis and tells Job to pray for them. Sometimes it sounds like they've given some sensible statements, and so God isn't condemning everything they said. But their basic presupposition, you'll find out, as we study this, was wrong. They said, a righteous man cannot suffer. Not like Job. And that's where they were wrong. And God condemned them for that. 
Job offered sacrifices for their forgiveness. Now, the great question in the book, we've already raised the question in the book, Why do the righteous suffer? Is suffering an indication of divine displeasure, which is resulting from one's sin? That basic question isn't raised by Job, but by Eliphaz in his first speech in chapters 4 and 5. And here's his basic presupposition, which is the basic theme of the whole book. Eliphaz says every effect must have a cause. The curse causeless does not come, I believe he said. Every effect must have a cause. Job's sufferings, therefore, are the result of his sin and it's a sign of divine displeasure. He and his friends don't move from that basic presupposition. But Job says, there must be something wrong. I thought this too. Must be something wrong. He said, I've never been guilty of the things that would result in such divine chastening or judgment. And so the problem is raised by, not Job, but by Eliphaz. And that's the problem the book seeks to solve in all those discourses. Is all suffering the result of sin? And if not, then why do the righteous suffer? And so there's a lot to be learned by our answering that. We've done a lot of preaching on Job, but we didn't read out of the book of Job or tell you it was from Job. It's from the lessons we learned from Job. Why do the righteous suffer? So often in our counseling as well as our teaching, I've told people sometimes there's no answer. Well, what am I to do? Do what Job did. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's faith. That's the message of faith. The book of Job is one of the richest books in the Bible. It'll help you through places that you'd never get through if you didn't understand some things. Now a word about the man Job, and then we'll maybe stop there tonight. The man Job. The book takes its name from the principal character, Job. And Job wasn't his name, but like so many English translations, we don't get much help from the translations. The Greek Septuagint translates his Hebrew name as that, I-O-B, and an I is a J or a Y in English, so it ended up Eob, which is Job. But actually, his name is Eov. No J on it. For you Hebrew students, Eov. Which in English would be long E, Y, Y, O, B, but pronounced V. So Eov, that's his name, Eov. Turn to the book of Eov. I suppose that'd be close enough. Most didn't know what you're talking about. You know, the critics often deny the historicity of everybody in the Bible, including God, I think. But the historicity of Job is proven from other passages. He's mentioned in other parts of the Bible. You know where? Offhand, anybody? Anywhere? Okay, James 5 is one. James 5.11. Let me read that. That's the New Testament. James believed in Job's existence. We count them blessed which endure. You've heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. That is chapter 42. You saw how he was blessed. Another reference is Ezekiel 14. Ezekiel 14, verse 14, and verse 20. And God speaks to Ezekiel concerning the wickedness of Jerusalem. And here's what he says about that city. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Eov, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. 
which means that God, not only in the book of Job, God calls Job a righteous man, but he calls him righteous here. So why do the righteous suffer? That's the theme of the book. But he said, though these three men were in Jerusalem, Noah, Daniel, Job. That's what God thinks of Noah and Daniel and Job. And then in verse 20, Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in Jerusalem, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. So we have other witnesses to the historicity of Job. Not that we need it, but there it is. As to his character... His character, he's characterized as a truly pious and righteous man. Verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uts, mispronounced by everybody Uz, so I guess we'll stay with it. The land of Uz, whose name was Eyo, mispronounced by everybody as Job, so I guess we'll stay with that. (laughs) There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright. Perfect and upright. Somebody says, oh, we can't be perfect. Well, Job was. Jesus said we should be. Matthew 5, 48. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. And then God himself testified to his righteousness in Ezekiel 14, 14. And also here in verse 8 of Job 1. The Lord said to Satan... Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there's none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man? No wonder Job was saying, why was I born? (laughs) With all he was going through, he couldn't understand it. Because the righteous are supposed to be blessed, and he really was, until the roof caved in. Then the name Job, we've already mentioned its pronunciation, but the name Job occurs throughout history. It's not exclusive for him. It's found in archaeology in the 19th century B.C. as a prince of the land of Damascus. His name was Job, a prince of the land of Damascus. 19th century B.C. would be about when Job lived, you see. Assuming this book is 2000 B.C., Then he's mentioned in another reference in the what's called the Amarna Age, which is the 14th century B.C., as a prince of Pella, P-E-L-L-A. Job was a prince of Pella. So we know two Jobs. Now Pella was up to the east of the Sea of Galilee. That's 14th century B.C. So there are ancient references to a man named Job. And they're both kings or princes. Now, Jewish tradition identifies Job with Jobab. Jobab. J-O-B-A-B. Jobab. Who was the king of Edom. Jewish tradition. Genesis 36, 33. Well, it just mentions the various kings, and that's all that is a reference. 36.33, And Bela died, mentioning the kings of Edom, and Jobab, the son of Zerah of Bozrah, reigned in his stead. And Jobab could be a lengthened form of the name of Job. And in Job 29.25, he calls himself a king. Whether that's to be taken literally or not is another question. Because in the context, he's referring back to his past respect by princes and so forth. He said, I sat in their midst as a king. They really respected his opinion. Jewish tradition, at least one stream of Jewish tradition, identifies Job with the king of Edom. Now, Edom's all right. That would be all right because he isn't called an Israelite here in the book. And Edom, of course, was the nation that Esau founded, who was the brother of Jacob. Jacob and Esau, remember? That would make him an Edomite, but would have Abraham's blood in his veins, you see. But he was a righteous man. 
and he's called the greatest man of all the children of the East. So, while Edom isn't East, yet he definitely wouldn't be an Israelite if they use that terminology of him, probably. Which brings us to the home of Job, since we mentioned his name, let's mention his home. There's no way to know where us is, or literally, it's, in the Hebrew again, it's Uts. But it's the land of us, it got translated that way, so I guess we leave it that way. Well, just quickly the views of where us was. <laughs> Not as is, but as was. Job's home, we're told, the land of us was in or near Edom. That follows the Jewish tradition. In or near Edom, the land of us. Now, Edom, of course, that map doesn't show it, but it's down to the south of Palestine. Edom was south of Palestine. Now, Those who hold to this view make reference to Jeremiah 25.20, Lamentations 4.21. Jeremiah 25.20, Lamentations 4.21, which they think suggests that us was Edom. And Eliphaz was from Edom, one of his friends. We know that. So he could have been in the land of Edom when they were doing all this talking. Eliphaz was from Teman, T-E-M-A-N, which was in Edom. Another view is that the land of Uz, which we don't know where it was, is Haran, H-A-U-R-A-N, is Haran. That's near the Sea of Galilee. That's the east of the Sea of Galilee. Another view is that Uz is a region near Damascus. Job is said to be the greatest of the men of the east, and that would certainly put him over east in Damascus. And Uz is the name of the son of Nahor, N-A-H-O-R. Uz is the name of the son of Nahor, who was the brother of Abraham, who came from the east. So, like... Judah was the name of a son, and that became the name of a tribe and the name of a geographical location. And Edom, Esau was called Edom, that became the name of his country. Moab and Ammon were sons of Lot, that became names of countries. So the son of Abraham's brother was named Uz, and Abraham and his brother came from the east, so that could be his land also. So... Some believe it's in the east near Damascus, his land. Wherever Job was, he wasn't in Palestine. And most people, when they read the book, I guess they thought he was in Jerusalem having all this experience. And a fourth and final view is that it's Lower Lower Mesopotamia, which is down near Babylon, beneath Babylon, Lower Mesopotamia. One archaeologist states that there is a country at, when he wrote this last century, said there's a country at the mouth of the Euphrates River, that's down in lower Babylonia, lower Mesopotamia, called Uz, the land of Uz. So was Job over there? And that's originally where perhaps the Garden of Eden and all was originally in that area. Most believe the beginning of history as we know it started there in that area. And the mention in the book of the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans lends support to that view because the Sabaeans are from Sheba, down in that region, and the Chaldeans are the Babylonians, the early name of the Babylonians. And so maybe Job was over there from where Abraham was. You see, Abraham came from Chaldea, which later became the region of Babylonia. I don't know if it will help to know where he's from, but... The latter two views we gave you, one of those would probably be nearer. I don't see how the Jewish tradition in this case could be too acceptable because he's called the greatest of the men of the east and Edom is south of Palestine. It could have been said that of him, 
comparing men of the east as the wise men and rich men with their caravans and so forth. And Job was greater than all the men of the east. That wouldn't mean he's from the east to say it that way. But at least it gives some understanding of where Uz Uts might have been.